Hello, welcome, good evening, good day, welcome wherever it is you are joining us from. Welcome to TikTok UK, the latest episode celebrating Black History Month. Of course, October is all about black history and today to specifically is all about mental health. It's World Mental Health Day. So of course it made sense for TikTok UK to bring together Black History Month and look at mental health within the black community. And what a year it's been, right? Nothing so much has happened, really. It's been quite quiet. Pretty much what we expected 2020 to be, right? Not <laughs> opposite. This year has been crazy. Of course, we're still in the midst of the pandemic. Uh, within that, it looks like when it comes to people who were most adversely affected in all of that were black people, Asians, ethnic minority. Then with all of this, there is a sad death of a man in police custody in America, which isn't the first time it's happened, but for some reason it resonated more so not just within the black community, but throughout the world, so you're dealing with that. But then also there's this new found, which is a positive thing, a new found look at how uh, black people have been living in life, how dealing with racism, discrimination, bias, you've got the societal look at, at all of those things, which is great, but then, also triggering, right? So it's suddenly black people are looking at themselves and looking at their lives and dealing with all sorts of issues. So today we are going to be looking at how all of that has impacted uh, black people and uh, black people's mental health, but then also a general look at why things can be so tough for this community. And we have a fantastic panel to do that with. Now, first up, we have June Sarpong, TV presenter, author, and right now heading up creative diversity at the BBC. Good to have you, June. Hi, my lovely. Also, we've got Patrick Vernon. Now, you are a journalist, a social commentator, but this year, now an author as well. We're going to be talking a little bit about that with you as well. And we've got Lord Victor Adebowale. So let me just say, though, when I say Lord, we're not talking about man was born and then then he was made law. <laughs> this is a man who spent decades supporting black people when yeah. it comes to health, social care, mental health. So yeah, literally yeah. this is somebody who's earned that we title, bow. okay? So no yeah. haters out there. And across the pond <laughs> no, in go. LA, in sunny, hot LA, very different to what things are like in London right now. We have Baz Morgan, reality TV star, who is now a huge, huge campaigner when it comes to mental health. Really good to have you, Vaz. Good to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Really, really good to have you here. So look, just to kick things off, we've got so much to talk about. Uh, Victor, I want to start with you because this is your bag. This is something that you've been working on, as I said, for decades. I've been around. I'm going to ask you the big question. Mm. When it comes to black people, why are black people more likely to be to have mental health issues? Mm. What's going on there mm. from your experience? Well, I mean, my experience is not as important as the research and the evidence. So if you look at Professor David Williams and his work at um, Harvard um, University, what he's shown um, through, through many, many um, years of research is that black people actually suffer what he calls microaggressions. And um, this, the, these microaggressions have the same impact as water on sandstone. Mm. And these, he's measured the impact on both mental health and physical health of these just day-to-day -day aggressions, I mean, just day-to-day -day things. Um, I won't go into the details of it, but black people, certainly in um, the US and in the UK, just, just by living here, actually suffer day-to-day -day pressure, stress, yeah. just getting up in the morning, walking, um, going to work, doing your thing. And then if you couple that with the kinds of racism, which is actually uh, systemic and structural, I know that some people debate that, I respectfully disagree with them, then you are, you are facing um, disproportionate challenges, both on your physical and mental health. And then when you look at things like COVID, the first 10 people to die in the NHS were black, disproportionate impact, more likely to live in poorer areas, less likely to get the jobs um, in most of our institutions, regardless of how qualified you are, you know, it, it all adds up. This is it. And when you, you know, I, in a way, I don't like the term microaggression because it's actually not, not nothing to do with, uh, with you talking about it, but 
it's so huge to call it a micro well it, i mean it, and the impact the it can have well it's a, it's a it's a term that's researched yeah, i mean you don't have to like it just is it's a bit like no. you don't have to like the word gravity but it does exist right mm. and the, the thing is the difference between microaggression exist, but it's not microscopic no, no, it's no, huge no, no, you know the impact I'm, I'm using that word deliberately so microaggressions are things like so uh, one of the, one of the experiments that david williams did was um he filmed um uh, black people crossing the road and white people crossing the road and he worked out how many times cars stopped for to allow white people wow. to cross the road as opposed to black wow and it worked <laughs> we just worked out there's an evidence based you know behind this that black people the stars the cars stopped frequently less often than for white people mm. so you can measure these things these are just l the tiny little things that happen i'm not talking about the big things that happen like not getting promoted um being six times more likely to be stopped and searched by the police um having a worse experience and worst outcomes for cancer care mental health um diabetes yeah. obesity yeah. so th those aren't micro those are those are huge those are galactic but it's all part and parcel <laughs> but it's and and yeah so <laughs> Jean, what you've been doing, and this is what you're talking about in your, your latest book, Power of Privilege, mm. you're, you're, talk, you're looking at those microaggressions, actually, and looking at what can be done in terms of, in terms of what people can do to, to deal with that. What is well, your what advice? White people can do. What white people can do. Yeah, yeah what, what is your advice? So what have you found out with your work? Yeah, of course. Um, well, you, you and I talk about this in terms of the issues within our own industry. Um, and if we're looking at it in a wider context, it's, first of all, is acknowledging that systemic racism racism actually exists um, and also acknowledging um, that if you uh, belong to the group that has uh, characteristics that are the most elevated in society um, that you do benefit from this system and actually I think once that acknowledge, uh, acknowledgement um, is, is um, achieved and had we then can get to the place where we start having the honest conversation about okay then what do we need to do to dismantle some of these systems and what is the new thing we're going to create and i think in terms of um uh, what uh, white people can do uh, to challenge racism it's about also looking at yourself as an individual um, and how you are living your own life and what is the one thing you can do within your own social context that can change someone else's life. So if you are, uh, you live in an area and even if your kids do not go to the local state school, are you doing something to support the families of the children that do go to that state school? Um, if you are in a position to hire, are you making sure that you're not just mentoring talent of colour and black talent within your organisation, but you're actually being an advocate and a sponsor for them? Because that's much more impactful in terms of career progression. So there's lots of things that people can do, but I think the first thing has to happen is that we need to acknowledge it exists and educate yourself too. Yeah, Patrick, do you think there is... So this, Jean was just talking about what can be done in, in, the, in the world of work. Uh, Patrick, in terms of what maybe governments and leaders can do in terms of tackling mental health within uh, the black community, is there anything that can be done? Because you've for many, many years, you've been really, really lobbying government, and particularly uh, this year with the Windrush, uh, with the Windrush scandal, you've really been supporting uh, yes. victims of that. Sure. What can government really do, though, when it comes to making sure there's the right support for black people when it comes to mental health? I think government could do, can do a lot. I mean, in terms of what uh, June and Victor said, we have to put this in the historical context. Mm. So part of the historical context is about white privilege, white supremacy, and we need to decolonize mental health services. And what that means is that black star, black people that work in the NHS are recognized for their talent because we can make, we know the lived are and lived experiences around, uh, as Vic said, microaggressions and, and the bigger stuff. We know it, we live it, and we can actually change and improve service delivery. Why is it there are so many black people overrepresented in the psychiatric system? And it's been like this for the last 30, 40 years. And it hasn't, actually, it's probably going to get worse because of COVID-19 and other stuff that's happening as well. You know, because I think now we're experiencing new different types of trauma. So I think leaders could do much more. I think it goes to the point that June was saying about how are you going to use your white privilege? If you know, the data's there, the evidence is there, and, and Victor's chair in the um, race observatory will have even more data that will come out. What, the, you know, is interesting about Black Lives Matter, it's the first time that white people now understand, oh, we get it. 
We didn't realise that you experienced racism. We didn't realise <laughs> that all these, you know, that you, got, you have feelings, we have emotions. Mm. Hello, we've had feelings and emotions for the last 400 years, but we've been trying to articulate that for ages. And it's not like now people have got, the, got it. Now you know that, now you've got it. Well, you know, we can work together, but you've got to do your homework yeah. around looking at your own stuff. Uh, you know, because we're tired. Victor, are you tired? Actually, I'm feeling quite... <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what I am tired of. No, I'll, I'll tell you what I am tired of. Well, I mean, I, I consider myself far too lucky to be pessimistic, but I do think, you know, I, where I agree with Pat, I absolutely agree, you know, it's very simple in a way. I expect my leaders, black or white, to lead all the people all the time. I don't expect my government to lead some of the people some of the time. That's not what I'm paying for. <laughs> so you ask the question, what can government do? Yeah. Try leading all the people all the time. It's not... <laughs> Don't exclude certain groups. Not difficult. Right? That's Vaz, what paid for. Vaz, let me come to you. Let me look at you over here. Um, Walla, what, your last few years, Walla Turnaround, you've gone from a huge reality star, you know, living with the blinging and the jazzling, deciding now <laughs> to focus on mental health, particularly mental health within the black community. Why is that? Because I feel like a lot of people don't understand, like what Victor was explaining, the microaggressions, the impact that can have on black people and how it can make us feel undervalued and affect our own self-worth. For me personally, feeling I wasn't enough and that I wasn't valued started from going to school and not seeing myself in textbooks, watching Disney films and all the, you know, the characters' happy endings were, you know, these blonde macho white men that were princes and anyone that looked slightly different were the villains, even down to having red hair, let alone being black. I wasn't represented. There was no one for me that had a happy ending that was black. There was no one that looked like me on TV that was like gay and black. And all these things made me feel that I wasn't enough. I wasn't equal to my white friends. And there were things that my white friends would say to me without realizing was even racist that I wasn't even acknowledging as racism because me myself was like numb to it. Like, oh, you know, you're very different for a black guy. You know, you're really good looking for a black guy. You're, oh, my, fr my parents don't really like black people, but you're okay. And I was made to feel like I should be like honored that I'm okay, like almost turning against my own race. And this has such a negative impact on me and made my story and my journey a lot different to the mental health of my white peers because they haven't been told since basically birth by society that they are not good enough. Um, so that's why I know I went through my own journey. You know, I suffer from addiction and a lot of other depression and some other mental health issues. And I went and I got sober. I'm now three years sober. And it was through that clarity that I decided that I needed to help others that may be in my position. Well, first of all, congratulations uh, for being sober for so long. And it's I'm so sad to say this, that you're not alone, Vaz, as a black man who d did have to struggle with uh, addiction. In fact, we're talking about data. Let's look at some of the stats. If anybody might be watching and questioning exactly what the issues are when it comes to uh, black people and mental health, uh, let's look at the stats when it comes to drugs. Now, black men are uh, reported to have the highest rates of drug use and drug dependency than other groups. A survey found that black men were more likely than their white counterparts to experience a psychotic disorder. That's in the last year. Risk of psychosis in black Caribbean groups is estimated to be nearly seven times higher than their white counterparts. Detention rates under the Mental Health Act, this is in between 2017 and 2018, were four times higher for people in the black or black British group than they were for those in the white group. Uh, Victor, this isn't this isn't going to be something that's news for you. Um, no, me, I'm Patrick. So, I'm indeed. So, what do you think does need to be done to, to, to tackle this, particularly when it comes to black men dealing mm. with mental health mm. issues? What is going on there? Do you think well, it's an odd thing, actually? I, I think a number of things need to be done at the, at the macro level. Um, we need to do things like. Um, Stop having only one month for Black History. Like, what happened to the arrest? Some people think it's too much, what, but yeah. What, what, happened, what happened to the other, other eleven? You know that that would help because it's this is all contextual. You know, mm. it's it's all contextual. Mm. I think we need to acknowledge that um, uh, 30, 40 years 
uh, since we started measuring the impact of mental health on black people is too long. Mm. Um, we need to hold accountable the leadership of the mental health system, as I've said, for leading older people all the time. Um, we need to change the Mental Health Act um, so that it actually, okay. it actually um, respects the, the views and the experiences of black people. Um, I, looked, I did some work with the Metropolitan Police. Uh, um, uh, uh, Patrick was a colleague on that work. Mm. Uh, the police need training and retraining on their response to mental health. The NHS in this country um, needs to actually focus more clearly on interventions that support the black community and fund them, which is, which is pretty important because a lot of funding gets sucked out of the community. Internationally, um, there are variable responses to uh, minority ethnic groups um, in America, for instance, you know the health system. You, you, the Americans spend probably a good I can't remember what the percentage is, but they spend more per capita on their health system, but get, but have far worse outcomes, particularly for Black people. So um, you might call it socialized health. What I call it is equal and equitable health. So in this country, we need to focus on leadership accountability, proper funding and interventions that are race aware. Brilliant. Jean, in, in, terms of, in terms of the advice and support that black people can get and should get when it comes to dealing with mental health, um, what do you think there? What, what kind of support should there be? Well, I think it's picking up on what both um, Victor and Patrick have said in the sense that um, the kind of care uh, that we administer when it comes to mental health is very much from the white perspective and doesn't take into account um, the lived experiences of people of colour and particularly black people who perhaps are on the um, worst end of, of racism. Um, and, and the fact that there are all of these added um, uh, burdens that you carry on top of whatever other no other issues you may have and I think that because when you go into the mental health care system if you're going in as a patient how often is race even brought up in part of the treatment uh, and the discussions I mean I'm just thinking of tra yeah. traditional therapy I know I've had therapy yeah. Yeah. and I, I can assure you my therapist I've had different therapists but most of my therapists have been white and in in those cases race was never even brought up and so I think these are the sources that the, the, even gender wasn't even brought up yeah. so so it's almost as if we don't create a sort of almost like a bespoke type of therapy that takes into account that person's lived experience as to why they may have the issues that they have. And I think the minute we do that, then we'll be able to start solving things. Um, well, we'll be able to start actually diagnosing and then treating for the specific issue yeah. as opposed to just a blanket, yeah, one well. size fits mm. all. Because Victor, it's very interesting when you when you're talking about America and in terms of, despite the the huge amount of investment and money that they have for healthcare, mm. when it comes to healthcare for for black people, it's still wanting to pull it to pull it nicely because with the COVID pandemic. Mm. It kicked off in America first, and the figures that revealed that it was mostly black people yeah. dying, that came out first in America. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And my first thought was, well, you know, that's just, you know, racist America for you. Yeah. That would never happen here. And, and then, then boom. E exactly the same yeah. thing. Were you surprised um, that the impact that COVID was having on the Can black I community? touch on one yeah, no, sure. quick thing? Sorry, Patrick. Yeah, sure. what I, when people bring that up, I also want us to be very clear, that is not the case when we go to the countries of origin of most yeah. of these people of colour. In majority black countries or majority countries of people of colour, people are not dying disproportionately. In fact, they've got a better handle of this thing than we have. That's so it's so got to be something about the lived experience in the West which makes people more oh, likely exactly to die right. from yeah. it. Yeah. And we are, we are, why do you think that was? And what yeah. impact has that helped? And also had Brazil on... as well. I mean, remember, Brazil's got the mm. largest African diaspora population yes. outside the continent. Yes. So Brazil, the USA and the UK. Yeah. And I think in many ways, I think it exposed the current inequalities in society, the structural racism, the health inequalities. Uh, and actually, there's been a disinvestment in public health in Britain for the last 12 years as a result of austerity and cuts. So it means that the infrastructure, there's a fragility of stuff. So if you live in overcrowded housing conditions, uncertainty about your job, a lot of people are working the front line mm. in the NHS, retail uh, and transport. And that's where, that's where the greatest impact had 
within the black community. Yeah. And on top of that, um, the, con the social conditions that we experience, what Victor talked about, the microaggressions, all this adds together. It's, a, it's like a toxic cocktail, mm. uh, which is, you know, obviously in America, it's very, you know, like, I know people, uh, I've got family in New York, and they work in the care system, and they're telling me what's happened there. It's quite horrific, you know, basically bodies, the way they've, even the whole process of people who've died in hospitals, no proper burial. I mean, I lost my brother-in-law to COVID-19 here mm, in, the, in, so the West, in the Midlands, and it has an impact. Remember, over 50,000 people in the UK have died, maybe even more, of COVID-19. Uh, but in the black community, proportion is even higher. The half the women's generation are disappearing because of COVID-19. Young people are dying because of COVID-19, and yet the government response is... Well, what is the government response? That's a good question. It's not taking it seriously uh, in many ways because it goes back to Black Lives Matter. How do our lives matter or valued? And I think the whole stuff around the impact in America, in the UK, is the same experience. It further reinforces the fault lines of structural racism, lack of care, lack of acknowledgement. And luckily, we're still doing stuff. And people in the community are responded to try and support the best way we can without that leadership that's been given that we require. And Vaz, as I said earlier, so we're dealing with this pandemic. News is coming out that, hey, if you, if you are a black, Asian, ethnic minority, you could be in trouble, more trouble. And then you're having the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter in this huge way, Black Lives Matter movement. And for you, you found it very triggering, but it, it led to you to start opening up and talking about the kind of things maybe you were reluctant to talk about. And there was a huge backlash, which led to you starting your, your mental health campaign. Yes, I think prior to this 2020, anything that I spoke about that was personal to me, um, I would have felt like I was like the bemoaning black man. And it's, it's very common that someone as direct as myself, as a black man, will be mistaken for aggression or the angry or, you know, the woe is me. And I think what Black Lives Matter did is open the platform for us to finally be heard and listened to. And so I wanted to take that opportunity to use my voice to help others. And going back to what June said earlier, for me, when I was on the TV show that I was on, I came out on the show and that was a huge moment for me. And although I did have mental health support from the production company, every single person I spoke to were white women. And when I was explaining to them about my coming out process, and being slightly different because I'm black, they wasn't understanding it and no one ever was there to support me that was black. And I was like, although you're very educated and I get that you may be amazing at your job, without that life experience um, of being a black person, you can't understand the difference of being a black gay man in the UK and being a white gay man. Um, I grew up in Jamaican culture. My parents are Jamaican. So, you know, growing up in the household, nearly every song I listened to was violent attacks against homophobic people referenced in every single song. So I thought being a gay black man in my community, I'm going to get killed walking down the street, you know? Mm. And my parents now live in Ghana. And so I travel Africa quite a lot. And in a lot of African countries, it's still illegal, punishable by death. Mm. So it's a very different experience to being a white gay man. And without you know, my mum was, my mum, 70 years old, she was raised in a very different era in Jamaica and then Africa. Her views towards me, having a gay son will be very different to a white woman being brought up in England. And I just don't think neither the viewers of the show and anyone in the production or higher up understood that. And that was really detrimental for me. So I just wanted to start this platform to show that the mental health issues and what causes them and the treatment is very different between white people and black people. Yeah. How are you doing now, Vaz? I mean, I'm doing, I'm doing great now. I really am. I'm, I'm happy and I've learned that I am enough and that I am valued and I'm perfect the way I am. And I want to spread that message to other people because I think it's a message that's not heard enough by anyone just to just love themselves the way they are. Yeah. You know, it's really, really interesting, oh, actually. Um, Jean, I want to talk to you. Gosh, Vaz, you're Ghanaian. Jean's Ghanaian. I'm Ghanaian. What the? Yeah, so, Chalice, we are just taking over. <laughs> but I'm talk, I just want to talk about hey, actual the communities. <laughs> yeah. Don't the Nigerian. Don't forget that. All right, right. OK. Don't forget that. Let's put in this little fruit bowl. OK, it's a mix, all right? I just thought I'll just, I'll just acknowledge the Ghanaians as well. Um, but it's, I, I would like to focus on how difficult it can be within the African and Caribbean communities. Mm. 
naivety mm. when it comes to yes. talking about mental health. Yeah. I don't even think mental health was in my vocabulary until about five years ago. Um, and I look back and I can... I look at that my mum and she was a single mum. Mm. We were living in a council estate. Mm -hmm. We were poor. Mm. We were really poor. And the pressure. Of and that. the pressure. I could, my mum, she was on the verge of breaking down. I look back and think, OK, now I see why you were angry <laughs> all the time. Mm. Um, but she was literally on the verge of breaking down. Yeah. And I, I look back and think, if we just talked and acknowledged, you know, that we were sad or we were struggling, maybe that would help. Well, what's, what's going on there? Why do, well, why do African Caribbean struggle I think we also do have to think about what it was that they had to deal with. You know, they, they, had, a lot. they had left uh, their countries, um, they'd come to a, a new country, um, and it wasn't necessarily with open arms, you know, it may have sort of appeared that way, but the reality of it was very different once you arrived. And then, regardless of what you were trained to do in your original country, you weren't going to get that level of work Stop here. So just the, the, the pressure of that life meant you didn't have the luxury of looking at how you were yeah. feeling. Mm -hmm. You were just getting by. And actually, it was probably too dangerous to to. to to go into your emotions. She didn't have the luxury of breaking down a single mum with kids to look after. She had to be hard and tough just to carry on. And the next generation, we have more of the luxury to be able to look at that stuff. And hopefully our kids will be way more advanced than us. But they didn't have it like that. Uh, have you guys, any of you seen uh, the latest series of Famalam? BBC Three. <laughs> yes. you, it no, is no, no. excellent. There's one. Well, there's I'm glad one you're skit. saying that. I love Family. Yeah, I like it. Yeah. Anyway, I'm have to I know, it's no, no, such no, no. a good show. It's, it's, it's difficult because it's a it is talking. Show. It is basically parodying yeah. and sending up certain aspects of the African and Caribbean community. Yes. So some of it might be tough. Mm. One of the things that they brought out though, they had this rich uh, African prince. Yeah, and he was a prince in Nigeria, mm. and he came down to the UK, came down to London, and he's walking up Peckham High Street with a little like really poor yeah. and with a little blue bag. That was their experience. And this is, and this is it. You, people think that immigrants are coming here to live the life when actually they're leaving something where they yeah. were seen, okay, yes. maybe not as kings, but they had a really, well, they were established. The, for my the houses yeah. they lived yeah. in were, were huge, they yeah. had help, yeah. and then suddenly they're, they're, scram they're yeah, scrambling yeah, for money. Remember that people that came from the women's generation, that came from the Caribbean, Africa, they were the youngest and the brightest talent. Yeah. Yeah. It was a brain drain that left Africa yeah. and, and different parts of the Caribbean to come here. And then that brain drain was abused by the system here, the colour bar, you know, the, you know, the discrimination, and the birth, the covert discrimination. And that's why our, our parents' generation had to hold it. You know the expression, black don't crack? Well, they were holding it for us because they wanted to create a safe space for us as children to grow up. And that's why we're here. You know what I mean? So we have to acknowledge that there were sacrifices. And it's unlike now that, you, if you look at dementia rates, mm. that generation now are suffering from dementia much earlier yeah. wow. because they've held this, yeah. the microaggressions in their bodies for such a long time. Wow. It's a complicated question you asked um, because, um, you know, Nigeria um, is particularly homophobic. I mean, we need to respect what you've, you know, it's, I think uh, Nigeria is a particularly homophobic place. It has a poor health system, um, far worse than this country or the US and basically has no welfare state. So, you know, you, you can sink to the bottom. And Ghana. Um, so if you're gonna be black, actually it's not a bad idea to be black here than it is in Nigeria to a, to a, to a, to a, to a degree. Some people will be listening to that thinking, yeah, that's, however, <laughs> that's right. However, in terms of the however, you know, not so full. you're unlikely to be discriminated against yes, because indeed. you're black. Yeah. And um, there are other things about the Nigerian culture which actually we could learn from uh, the Ghanaian culture. The, the poverty issue is, is really important. Poverty changes the way you think. It literally, it changes the way you think. It changes your ability to think mm. and it changes your ability to reason. That's just poverty. It doesn't matter whether you're black or white. So you think, put on top think, of that indeed, racism. Say, do you think that has a huge impact toxic. in terms of the black mental of health issues does. in black yeah, yeah. communities and socioeconomic it does. issues? It, well, it does. It's not, it's a, it's a, it's a fact. If you, poverty changes the way you think. And wow. um, so it, re it reduces your ability to make choices, it, it reduces your ability to rationalise, and it creates a short-termism about your activity and your thinking. Right. That's, that's a fact. You put on top of that the, the uh, strictures of racism and you've got a toxic cocktail. And I, I'm, with, I'm with Patrick. I think my parents and 
um, retained, a, tried to retain a safe environment, Correct. you know, mm -hmm. because actually we didn't have a mental health system that was anywhere, I mean, we, we criticise the, the system now, it was far worse then, yeah. you know, no blacks, no Irish, no dogs, um, and that was in the health system. My mother was a nurse for 40 years, so, you know, it, this, so this is, it, this, there wasn't a place where you could safely crack, as it were, other than within your community, and we must the respect the, the communities, Jamaican communities, yeah. Ghanaian communities, Nigerian communities, who actually held it together in order that, you know, yeah. we could grow up basically, but they're paying the price Absolutely. and they're still paying the price. Yeah. And it's interesting you say that, uh, Vaz, if I can put this to you, because I, th I would think as a child and I was growing up, I thought, you know, if I just make it, you know, I'm, you know, if I make it, yeah, if I, you know, start making the money, get a good job, racism will end. <laughs> and, but then, hey, <laughs> I, how, how ignorant was I? Um, it doesn't but yeah, end, but it becomes It doesn't yeah. end, and it, is, it is another it level of race. So you, you, can, you can deal with mental yeah. health issues um, because of um, socioeconomic um, yeah. reasons, yeah. Yeah. but then also you can have that step up, you can yeah. start making the money, start getting the, the roles, like you're still much. facing, that's a kick yeah. in the teeth, I have to say, you're still facing yeah. the microaggressions, yeah. the bias, the discrimination. Yeah. Would, would you say that's, that's true, Vaz? Yeah. I mean, I am extremely privileged in the life that I live and I, I'm aware that despite my colour or my sexuality, I still live a very privileged life. But at the same time, being in this industry as a black man is... I have a whole different set of issues that my, my race has, has, you know, opened the doors to, unfortunately. So it is very difficult and we're very underrepresented in, in every industry. I mean, growing up for me, the only, like, honestly, the only person that I looked at and thought I can be successful was June. So when I heard she was Amen. I was like, wow, a bit starstruck because yeah. literally I used to watch TV and I never thought being on TV was even an option until know, June started punk. And I was like, wow. whoa, a dark skinned, beautiful black woman. Aww. like so educated and so talented on TV right. and being celebrated, this is incredible. And it gave me the opportunity to oh, think, okay, well, there's, there's a chance for us all. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 it's true. I'm gonna say a couple of That's things. That's the truth. Mwah, yeah. mwah, mwah. I'm gonna say a couple of things in but response still, to what you were saying. We're still underrepresented. Yeah. I think that's I think that's true, and it's certainly the case that June's appointment is definitely a tick. Yes. But mm. you know, it's not all you. No. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah, that yeah. One of the dangers of you know they create they the give the job to a black person, they expect you to solve the problem. If the leadership, the leadership of the BBC, I'm afraid, have to lead all the people all the time. You're yeah. there to help. Mm. But can I just say a word about the hom homophobia? Because mm -hmm. I think it's really important that we, you know, that Address we do acknowledge it. what has has said about that you know because often when people talk about race and mental health they talk about it in terms of race or homosexuality not, not in sex now it's, it's, yeah, no, yeah. the fact of the matter is it's and and if yeah. you talk if you deal with race yeah. all of the characteristics improve that's just a fact why yes. because black people happen to be gay <laughs> yeah. lesbian you know disabled and so when when i talk about race i'm inclusive of mm. The all different groups. Absolutely, and we have yeah. to, we have to, because there's a, there is a, still a lot of work to be done in the black community right. and in um, places like Nigeria and Ghana and, you know, the US, on this question of homophobia in the black community. Yeah. It's what, an and, what and thing. What can be done then? You, what, you where do, where do you start? Well, I think you have to start by talking about it, by actually making yes. it discussable. The future is decided by the things that we don't yes. discuss, not the stuff that we do. I think it's important that, that that, that Taz and people like yeah. him are able to say who they are and to get a response, not just from people who happen to be um, gay, but from people who happen to be black. Yeah, right? I, I think, so, I it, think that when people, talk about, when people talk about allyship, when people think about allies in terms of how white people support black people, but within the black community, allyship applies around yeah. um, working with the LGBT community. Mm. So one of the things that I've done working with my colleague, uh, Dr. Linda Asborn, our book on Regret Black Britons, we have featured about half a dozen LGBT and trans really people important. as really, yeah. part of that because it's about normalising mm. the yeah. experiences that we're, yeah. all of us are black. We have a, a, a intersectionality, mm. we're diverse in all shapes and sizes. We're not this minor, this monolith that all black people look that way, talk yeah. that way. We're different, we're diverse. Yeah. Mm. And look at the diversity here, Very all, all yeah. of us. Mm. And, and often the way that the media portrays stuff. You're either it's black so, it's or so, you're gay. Well, yeah, it's, it's so narrow. It's, it's so, you know, it's so narrow. I mean, mm. Britain is still caught up with the colonial past. And sometimes we get trapped in that colonial past. Uh, uh, 
And it's like, it's like a cross between, and if it's on TV, it's either, it's cross between EastEnders and Holby City Stroke, Downton Abbey. And, it, and you have to fit into a stereotype to, to survive. And that's further reinforced the priority. Two of those shows are very, very good. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 which two? two. Which two? Obviously, which two? Yes, of course. The BBC shows. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay. Obviously. Okay, heartbeat then. So, okay, heart, heartbeats. Okay, it's, it's, it's like a crate in the... Still ITV. Yeah, yeah, so there you go, there you go. Can, uh, can I just pick up on that in terms of um, sort of the, the, the relics of colonialism? What we also forget is this homophobia was imported by the West. This is part of the, the, what, the impact that Christianity had on black and African cultures. If you look at the original cultures, we were not homophobic. Much of this comes from the, the impact of, of Christianity and the Abrahamic faiths on the continent. And actually, I think we also need to remind people of the culture pre-colonialism, and, and as part of that, a lot of this stuff will be dealt with too. I think if you look at our original yeah. culture, we were not homophobic yeah. people. I think so it's important that, yeah. I think it's important that it, we, it's versions of those religions rather than the religion themselves, Correct. because exactly. there are many Christians and Oh, Muslims no, I'm a Christian. She is, yeah. 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 Yeah, it's versions. Yeah, Raz, yeah, talk and explain a little bit more in terms of then uh, being a homosexual and a black man, what role, what that played, the combination of that in, in regards to your mental health? Well, it, what's crazy is that it's, I can't understand how a, a, a race that are so oppressed would even want to They'll oppress want to others. oppress another yeah. group, it's, yeah. It's crazy, but even like to recently, my mum, she texted me like one week ago and she's like, a lot of these problems is because you're obsessed with living in the West. You want to be in LA, you want to be in London. She's like, you need to just realise that they don't want you there, come home. And I'm like, well, the problem I have is if I do come home to yeah. Ghana, they don't want me there either. And this is a problem that I've had my whole entire life. My, all my white friends are very accepting of my sexuality and they love that side of me, but they're not truly accepting of my race. It's always like, oh, like, if you come over to my house, make sure my parents know you have a good job, speak well. Just oh my gosh, do people against. actually so, say that to you? you know, I've had that said to me, not as an adult, because now I wouldn't accept that. <laughs> but growing up, it was like, okay, like, make sure my, make sure my parents know that you went to this school and not that know. school, so that they know I'm a different type of black person. So I was always never accepted by them. And then when I was at home with my family and, my, and like, all my black friends, I was fully accepted for my race, but I couldn't be gay. So I was living a double life. Mm -hmm. And the streets, I was gay and happy, but I couldn't really be black mm. and at home I was like black and happy but I couldn't be, be gay, gay so I could never be myself and that's just something that <laughs> still happens today I can't roam around Africa and be with a holding hands with a guy and I can't you know roll around certain parts of London with a hoodie so mm -hmm. I can never be myself wow wow mm. yeah. so Ooh. powerful I mean it's interesting because I think this is the impact of the whole issue around identity mm. uh, and how can you express yourself as a black person and if you're not allowed to express yourself, it then what happens? It has an impact on your mental health, on your well-being, mm. and, and it's, it's a major issue. And that's sadly why I think one of the reasons why there's so many of us caught up in the mental health system. We're not allowed to be who we are, or even to be human beings, never least. And that it has a really major impact. I mean, I've worked for many years, mm. like with Victor Mental Health, I've, I've, I've facilitated support groups with black guys, talking about their experiences. And they've, you know, and, it, and the system does not care or understand. And yes, there is homophobia in the community, uh, you know, but it's actually much better compared to, say, maybe about 20, 30 years ago when it was really, really, you know, you couldn't do anything at all. Uh, but I think the issues around mental health in the black community, we've still got, we're more open. If you compare us to, say, Southeast Asian communities, or other communities, we talk more about it, at least. Mm. Uh, but the reason why we talk about it, we have no choice, because the way that we are disproportionately affected by uh, into the mental health. If you walk around London or any part of the major cities, you'll see black people displaying some elements of psychosis or, you know, like, and, and then people walk away embarrassed. They say, oh, well, nothing to do with me. Oh, you know, they're mad and crazy. But actually, it's, it's all part of our experiences. Have you struggled at all with any aspects of your yeah, mental I, health? I, I so how did you, you deal work, with it? I've worked in the mainstream organisations mm. for many years. And you do because, you know, especially if you're a black male, yeah. yes. they want to put you in a certain box. Mm. So if they can't put you in the box, then it has an impact on your physical 
and mental health. Mm. Also, uh, I've been involved in lots of campaigns over many years. I have to say, being involved in the Wondrous scandal over the last mm. few years has affected my mental health. That must and be really rough. For the main reason is mm. when you're working in the community and people have been traumatized because mm. of the hostile Upload environment. To this you. is an expression called the carous liability. Yes. Yeah. You, 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 take, yeah. you, take you absorb yeah. people's traumas. Yes. There's also and moral harm. Seriously, well. and, and when you absorb people's traumas, then it has an impact on you. And it had an impact on me. Yeah. And, so, and that's uh, take, sometimes I take a step back because yeah. then if you're going to be an effective campaign, you have to look after yourself. So, yeah. I mean, we talk about self care, but it does have an impact on you. And, and even now, I mean, Paulette Wilson, a good friend of mine, she died two months ago, uh, Windrush campaigner. It's affected me even now because I worked with her, worked with her daughter, other campaigners, and she died at 64 years old of a broken heart. Oh. Mm. And that is linked to mental health. Mm. She gave up the will because she was fighting. And how much for do we have to fight? I, I know of Paulette. She was, she was. so frail yeah. towards the end. That woman yeah. was, had, had been fighting, yeah. seriously fighting. Yeah. I mean, if you've been and detained in a her. detention centre, that is the worst experience for anyone. You're locked up, hapis corpus. You're not sure if you're going to be deported. You're not being, you're not committed a crime, but the, you're like, it's like a holding pen. And to me, I mean, the government talks about they, they want to right the wrongs. If they were serious about righting the wrongs, close our centres down and set people free. That's what needs to happen. Yeah, I agree. V Victor, where, where do people go? Where can yeah. people go when it comes to needing to talk, mm. having issues that they finally acknowledge and they recognise and, and mm. someone's saying, you know what, I, I just need a little bit of help. Mm. Uh, where, where can people go? Well, it's better than it was. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's certainly better than it was when we started um, yeah. uh, the circles of fear oh, and God. the um, yeah. we did the uh, the the survey uh, that that um, uh, Professor uh, Kamlesh Patel did. Count, the, count me in. Uh, yeah, count me in. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's improved. So there are some things that have been shown to have a um, an impact on Black people's mental health positively. So like what? Um, uh, there's certain CBT, so the um, access to improved access to mental health campaign, that's been shown, uh, well, services actually, have been shown to improve uh, Black mental health slightly more. So your doctor should know. So if you suffer from um, a depression or anxiety, which are the most common um, uh, mental health uh, um, ailments, then CBT for a lot of people can help and has been shown to help uh, black people. Um, there are more uh, um, uh, services now, and many of them set up by that man actually <laughs> in <laughs> London. Well, the, the work that you did with the with the mayor um, to Do you support. Remember Patrick? To, to support. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm not. No, 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 no. Well, so, so <laughs> I'm, trying to, I'm, trying, I'm, I'm trying to think of the specific <laughs> service. I'm trying to think of what specific <laughs> services. But there, there have been there have been a number of specific services for Black people in London and around the UK. Um, the, the problem is there aren't, there aren't enough yeah, of them. And the it's interesting, yeah. June talked about um, psychotherapy, and I, I've been privileged enough to benefit from psychotherapy myself. I mean, mm. I'm a great believer in the fact that a life unexamined is a life yeah. not worth living, right? Yeah. So I managed to do that. But um, I've often been surprised at how few black psychotherapists there are. And even when you look at psychotherapy, the basic tenets of psychotherapy, Freud and, and Jung, they weren't exactly campaigners for race equality. So you need to find therapists that actually understand yes. and are comfortable with yes. um, race mm -hmm. as, as a dynamic in psychotherapy. And they aren't, they aren't that common. So my, the response to your question is seek help. You know, and if you live in this country, you're paying your taxes, you deserve the help. Um, there are um, organizations like NAFSIAT, which is the Black, yes. uh, Black Therapy Center, uh, but, there's, but there's not, that's in London. I think outside London, it gets very hard. Right. I mean, no, actually, I think, I think it's wrong. I, I, I think, think there's, there are more black mental health services outside London than in London. But the, London has a capital of 10 million people. There's, uh, there's hardly about one, there's about one, two services in London which are black led. That's interesting. Or, or, I was thinking of Wakefield. I'm, I'm, I'm a patron of an of a organisation called ACCI. Uh, it's a black mental health charity, being one of the longest running charities in Britain for mental health, nearly over 30 years started by a group of Rastafarians in the early 80s because the whole concept of drugs and, you know, mm. ganja psychosis and mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. Actually proven, so... Yeah, but anyway, so, so that, so that organisation has a whole range of services and the other organisations around the country. The problem is there's, 
not enough investment. So you've got organisations like Nasfiat, Batan, uh, saying, and, and there's Black Thrive in South London and other old groups. Black Thrive, that was yeah. the one that you said. Well, so it was Jackie, <laughs> Jackie Dyer that set Jackie. up. I was, I was like the first director. Yeah. But I think the key thing is I'm working with Batan uh, um, and Nasfiat because we're trying to develop a BME counselling service around bereavement because of COVID-19. There wow. was no natural offer. So one of the things, so, one of the, so what, what, I'm, what I mean by that is that outside the conurbation, so, it, you know, London, Bristol, Leeds, Birmingham, I think you'll struggle outside the conurbations to find specific interventions for black people. That's, my, that's been my experience. The, um, the, one of the things that the um, Observatory on Race and Health, which um, uh, the, the, the NHS Confed, which I chair, has set up, is going to be looking at, is mental health. And mm. it's looking at... Because the fact of the matter is, you should be able to, as a black person, walk into any mental health service for which you pay your taxes and get a service full stop. Mm -hmm. And that service should be um, a, a, a one that, that provides you with a good experience and a good outcome. What we know is that if you do go to uh, mental health services, the likelihood is that your experience will be worse and the outcomes will be worse. Yeah, That's so, and this, this is going to lead on to my next question, actually. Um, how do you destigmatize mental health within within the black community? I, I think that's a wonderful question, Claudia. I think really it's about making mental health and um, actively uh, protecting and nurturing your mental health the same you would with your physical health. Um, I think it's m much more um, effective to deal with this on a daily basis. So I know for myself, meditation is key, um, um, mindfulness in general. Um, and I think it's really about how we sort of reintroduce many of these um, practices that actually go long back in our history, mm. how we introduce them back into our culture. Um, and I think that really as, as mothers and fathers and as parents, uh, we should be demonstrating that to our children. Um, and I think it's really important that we do that on a daily basis so that when something tough does happen to you in life, you're just better equipped to deal with it. Deal with yeah. it. It's so true, actually. So with, with my kids, mm. I treat how, how well they are emotionally just as the same way as if they fall down and hurt themselves. 100%. So if they fall down and hurt themselves, oh my gosh, baby, what can I do? Let me get a plaster. Yeah. Or if anyone comes home and says, oh, I'm feeling a little bit sad or blue, oh my gosh, let's sit down, talk to me, what's making you unhappy, <laughs> let's see what we can do to resolve it. See, and I never used yeah. to do that. It's literally yeah. the last five years see I've been doing that. See how things have changed in one generation because your mother didn't do Never that, would do that. Yeah. Now it's like, I've got to talk to them, yeah. how are you feeling inside, mm. I think, always. You, I think you have to make it discussable. Yeah. Yeah. That's the first thing. Yeah. And then we have to introduce those interventions that work. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, transcendental meditation. Yeah, I love it all. A practitioner. Yeah. It does work. It works. Um, but we have to make it discussable and scalable. But I think, I think one of the key things we've, we've got to do, and, and certainly I have been involved in doing, is making those services that we pay for actually accountable for providing a yeah. good service for black people with good outcomes. Because, but, yeah. Yeah. but it's not just services. It's a, I mean, this is Black History Month. Carl Steve Woodson that founded Negro History Week in 1926, on the premise that it's about self racial pride, self esteem, yes, that's what I was going to say. Confidence, Let's and that is the reason why so Black History Month was adopted in Britain of. in 1907. I mean, that's why I do lots of around Black History. Yes, it's like having counselling for counselling services, mindfulness, making sure mental health services meet our needs, but it's about discovering self. Correct. And I've done a lot of work that is discovering self. I've travelled to Africa. I've travelled to Africa. So, you know, yeah. so I've travelled to the Caribbean heritage. Yes. I've done a lot of research work on my family history. Yeah. I've been to Senegal, yeah. found my roots there. It's really important around roots, history, yeah. identity. Correct. That is part of the full equation Remembering too. who we are as people. Absolutely, it's absolutely. Yeah. Such Baz, a wonderful... I think I like about Baz Patrick is, Baz, he does black history what, all what year. What do you think <laughs> needs to be done? What do you think needs to be done to destigmatise <laughs> black mental health issues? I think we need to start highlighting to everyone that mental health issues, in particular suicide, is a leading killer amongst black people. Yeah. And the more people hear that and realise that it's, it's, it's often more serious in physical illnesses, they need to take it more seriously. I also think society, in particular the media, needs to take responsibility for highlighting that black people are more than aggressive, are more than angry and more than strong. We are sensitive, we are vulnerable and we do need to help 
you know we can ask for help we don't have to be strong 400 years of slavery should show you that we are actually quite submissive as people and we're not we can't always be the strong person and i think young black boys in particular yes. are told by their parents that you know toughen up man up strong up but no you we can't always be strong we can ha we have to be vulnerable and it's okay to be sad and it's okay to feel lonely it's okay to feel these emotions yeah. because they are human emotions mm. And they're ones that need to be taken seriously because they're the ones that develop into more serious mental health issues. And I don't think they are nurtured, these emotions. They're this, you're just told to be a man and to be strong. Mm -hmm. If a black man's crying, it's Nothing he's the crazy black man. Nothing he's the crazy black man. man. But if a white man's crying, it's, oh no, what's wrong? You know, and there needs to be shown what you're mm -hmm. saying. There is nothing wrong with showing emotion. As a black That's person. Yeah. How, how, did you, how did you come to this point and, and are, are you are you out of it? Do, do you still struggle? Would you say certain elements? Oh, of course, I struggle every day. But now, what I realise is that emotions are all temporary. Happy emotions, sad yes. emotions—they're all temporary, and they come in waves. And it's okay to feel them all. Don't let any of them consume you because they're going to go. As sad as you are today is as happy as you'll be tomorrow. Mm. You just have to realise that. Just take one day at a time. Mm -hmm. And if you're sad feel it and reach out and speak to people because as much as you feel like you may be a burden believe me your friends would rather hear about your pain than your death yeah so yeah, just brilliant. speak to Ooh, them oh that's yeah, the that's line right good. there june how do you yeah. think workplaces are are dealing with mental health amongst black people as well because this is you know well i think like being seen as an angry black person yeah, and well, if you go in to complain or to even try to to vent to talk about something you might be unhappy about you could be dismissed as an angry black person yeah well i think claudia up until that, the sad um senseless killing of george floyd they probably weren't um but what has happened and i'm sure perhaps you've seen this even more than than me um victor is since since that killing i think for the first time employers employers were looking at mental health in general anyway because of covid mm -hmm. and because of the impact of on isolation and people feeling disconnected etc but after george floyd i think there is now a focus on the sort of trauma uh, that it sort of triggered and reignited amongst um, black colleagues uh, and, and, and staff. So I do think for the first time there is a focus on this, but the problem is there, there aren't enough mental health care professionals that are from the black community to be able to actually give this service in an authentic I way. There is actually. There are Do lots you of think in the workplace. In, there are lots of in the black, workplace. There are lots of black therapists and counsellors, but they're not they're not employed by the NHS. And they're all in private practice. Oh, mm, oh indeed. But what I was talking about is. Oh, oh no, 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 no. Yeah, but I know not at all. But I it's just most, workplace most workplaces wouldn't know where they to would find have. Them. Yeah, they would have um, somebody working in mental health Correct. with their team. You can go and speak to them. In any organisation I've worked for, this is all anecdotally, of course, but I haven't seen a, One. It's, it's a black outsourced face. Because most employee assistant programs are outsourced. I was they, say, they don't yeah. deal with yeah. the black experience. So you're in the, you're in the help line, you might get three, four counter sessions, but are they going to meet the needs that reflects your experiences? Well, mm. well, some are better than others. Most companies now have, have employee assistance schemes. The extent to which they're capable of dealing with yes. uh, racism or even bullying is a moot yeah. point. You know, I think some are better than others. I think there are some um, interventions that are uh, useful. So the mental health first aid, um, Poppy Jarman, there's a bit of a danger that the little knowledge can be a dangerous thing. But I think you know there is there are organisations like mental health first aid that that I know um, some of my uh, black colleagues have benefited from. I, th I think that the the COVID crisis has caused uh, employers to pay more attention. Okay. I do think there's a long way to go, though, before we get the kind of equity and equality of mental health in the workforce, because it's related to those other things we talked about. Mm. You know, if you look across, you know, um, the FTSE 100, if you look across broadcasting, the legal system, the criminal justice system, I mean, any system, you will not see, um, rarely, will, you will either not see or very rarely see black leadership. Mm. And sadly, you will hardly see, or it's not common now to see it needs to be more common that leadership, regardless of its colour, takes responsibility to lead all the people all the time. If you're doing that, then you'll put in place the kinds of support that women, black people, 
um, etc., can and benefit from in the, the workforce. Needs of Absolutely, older people yeah. all the time. Do you think it's worth still, or do you think it's worth uh, black people to go and have conversations with their their bosses, their colleagues, to, to talk about some of the issues that they're, uh, that they're it's, experiencing? It's a juxtaposition. Well, I mean, if you look at the whole stuff around grievances and disciplinaries, you know, we've always had to deal with that for decades. In light of Black Lives Matter, will there be less grievances, less disciplines against black people or seen as difficult or how difficult to engage with? Time will tell. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think self-organising is very important. So, you know, in terms of BME, black staff networks, that's important because it's about people sharing that. But it's also about um, senior leaders, and particularly white leaders, looking into themselves, as June said, and saying, I've got this privilege. I hear black people want... Uh, need, uh, I hear the concerns of the black community or my black staff or BME staff. What are you going to do about it? If we have a conversation this time next year and we see more companies stepping up to the plate, I think it's not enough now saying I'm a good EDI employer. Mm. It's about mm. saying I'm an anti racist employer. That's a litmus test. Yeah. Yeah. Anti racist employer. Yeah. <laughs> and you get a bad <laughs> <laughs> that you think these conversations are still happening with the same rigour and desire and will that we were seeing a few months ago when we were talking about racism, the reality of, of racism for, for black people. Do you think that's still happening or do you think it's kind of getting a bit muted? Oh, no, absolutely they're not still happening, unfortunately. I feel like... Of because of social media, the attention span of everyone is now, what, 15 seconds, you swipe. So what I want to say to people is, please stop waiting for a hashtag and don't wait for October Black History Month to have these conversations. Keep the conversations going mm. every single day of the yeah. year. Don't, don't just share our trauma. Don't, like, I trauma agree. porn is a real oh, thing. Agree. Don't go on Instagram and Twitter and, and reshare these senseless killings and thinking that's enough. Um, you don't get to live our trauma and then go quiet because we're still living it every single day. We are mm. still black. Mm. When the cameras are off and when social media goes to bed, we are still black. So I think just remembering that as our allies to have these uncomfortable conversations every single day, it shouldn't have to take one month for, for this to happen. This needs to happen every day of every month. The, man, the man's right. Absolutely. At the end of the day, yes. leaders have to learn on behalf of their organisations. You're responsible for the culture you create. Mm. And it goes to the point that we're tired. Why should we share our burden? <laughs> well, I take the responsibility. <laughs> I'm, I'm pushing up. No, I, 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 I totally, totally, totally agree, agree with Vaz as well, absolutely, though, that, yeah, absolutely. that the, com the conversations are not happening yeah. the same way. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. I mean, one of the things that I've noticed and I worry about the Black Lives Matter movement is that it becomes a logo, a brand. Mm. So it's all okay right to have the brand, but are you prepared to do the work? Mm. And the work does involve looking inwards, you know, yeah. who, who am I? What do I need to learn on behalf of my organisation? Yep. What am I prepared to, to, to actually uh, ask uncomfortable questions? Well, I, I very rarely say very Black important. Lives Matter anymore, be, not because obviously I don't care about uh, black lives and they don't matter, but um, it's been hijacked and it's been hijacked by either some people who have their own ulterior motives, but then also it's been hijacked by, uh, by racist groups mm. who are trying to use it mm. to, 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 as a whole new definition. I think there's a risk. I think yeah, there's always been that risk. Yeah, it's but not different. A lot of abolitionists, 18th century Britain, yeah. Black Lives Matter then, and Black yeah. Lives Matter now. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, it, I think it, what, what... I think the thing that Black Lives Matter, it invites a lot of performative activism mm, and, and what we need signaling. to be very yeah and it, you what we need to be very careful of is to go on social media and put you know black lives matter but what are you actually are doing you to contribute yeah, to yeah. the better of black lives mm. what are you doing because i see loads of companies companies that i've worked with in the past that i've even had to call out that have put, you know, we stand with black lives, but I'm like, really, what are you doing to stand mm. with us then? Mm. Show me your team. Yeah. Turn that camera there around and let me see what your team looks like, because I don't feel represented in your team. So please don't use our trauma to be represented on your I think that's media. a very strong point. I think this notion of, and I noticed it, um, with, with, this, with the, the, the death of George Floyd and, you know, horizontal lynching in broad daylight, that's why it was so shocking. Mm. And the fact of the matter is that, you know, <sighs> A lot of reaction from black people was about telling stories of their own experience of racism and then white people listened to it and said, oh, terrible, terrible, I feel your pain, da, da, da. And there's a part of me that thought, well, you feel your pain now? 
you know, it's like it's been going for hundreds of years. Now, yeah. now, we've, we've, now we've, actually so, been so, the first so, time so, and then it, and then it goes quiet. And constantly. I think there's a real danger that black people create a kind of um, infotainment mm. by telling sort of as though telling my story is going to yeah. change the, yeah. the, the change the, the system, system or change the activity. Yeah. I think I think appeals to 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 empathy. Um, have to be really carefully thought through. Mm. And I think it's really yes. about um, calls to action. It's about changing things. Yes. It's about holding people to account. Mm -hmm. It's about asking questions. Uh, you know, I th it seems to me that that's the space that we need to be occupying. I 100% agree with you. And mm. the couldn't have said it better. The, the what he yeah. said. The thing, yeah. things, <laughs> are, things are changing. We've right. spoken about the, the experiences of, of our parents that generation before, before us. Uh, June, how do you think things are changing for the positive? Well, I think the fact that we're even having this discussion in itself is different. Mm. Cool, yeah. you've been in telly in how many years? 20 years? <laughs> a long time. Yeah. Thanks for that. Yeah. <laughs> a very, very so, long time. So have I, yeah. so, you know, Indeed. No, no. Not, I'm aging I'm, myself I'm just, too. I'm catching up at your heels, but, but yeah, for a very, very long time. Five it, years ago, we wouldn't have been it, doing this. We wouldn't have been doing this, but it's so not interesting. Not in this way. Yeah, but yeah, You're seeing different kinds of conversations mm. and a new kind of energy towards uh, initiatives of past. It would be very interesting to see whether this energy uh, will will translate into something which would be more something profound, new, yeah. life, well, life, life changing, long, long I think term. It's interesting. We're having this conversation on TikTok. Yeah. Yeah. Right? yeah. So I'm expecting TikTok Indeed. not to do Black History Month. So, so but we're to moving do Black History. Just to do yeah. Black History. Oh, black just history season. Anyway. Every day. Yeah. So on that note, <laughs> I have to say thank you all so much, uh, Victor, June, Patrick, and Vaz in hot, sunny Yay. LA. Yay. 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 Yeah, it's about some lots of things are going cool on guy. lots of things cool are happening guy. for good and it's just really really good to see that we this just the fact we are sitting here talking about black people and mental yeah, health in this here. way is an incredible and positive thing tiktok uk is doing plenty more you can just head there using that hashtag my roots and also you can go to tiktok uk's newsroom to find out a lot more about what they're doing for black history month and hopefully it'll be spread across the year yeah. thank you so much for joining us guys take care bye 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 <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Oh my gosh, yeah, shall I stop? They're all fucking you. Oh, okay.